All right, Genesis chapter 16. Uh, I want to minister this morning about God's perfect timing. I'm going to get straight to it for the sake of time, no pun intended. God's perfect timing. But the text that we're going to read is the account of a married couple, Abram and Sarai. Uh, They've been waiting to have a child. She cannot fall pregnant. It just doesn't seem to be working. Abram's not holding his face the right way or something, but she's not falling pregnant. And so like you and I, what they do is they take things into their own hands. And this is something that every one of us do periodically, that we, we can't wait on God, we become impatient, and so we begin to concoct our own uh, approach to what perhaps we should do. And this is what they did, and it was a mistake, it was a bad error. And the lesson for you and I is, I think, becomes very, very self-explanatory. I want to read the first six verses of Genesis chapter 16. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now the Lord has estranged me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. You know, if you stop and think about that one sentence, there's a great deal has gone on here. Think about it. Verse 3, then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar and made the Egyptian and gave to her, I uh, gave her rather, to her husband Abram to be his wife. And after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. And then Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now, I want us to consider, first of all, about there being wisdom in waiting. Because many times God's time frame seems very slow compared to the world's way of thinking. You know, we live in a day where technology has advanced things so rapidly that it perhaps almost subconsciously in our minds causes us to behave the same way. Or perhaps our anticipation, our expectation, and I think how life has changed. In the 1950s, uh, my father used to drive a truck from Alice Springs to Darwin in the Northern Territory on the Stewart Highway. He drove the first semi-trailer they ever had. And it used to take him up to five days. That's a long time. When we were living in Alice Springs, Kerry got up one particular morning with the trailer on the back of the Tarago, loaded the children, left Alice Springs, and she was in Darwin by 7 o'clock that night. Did the same drive in one day. Why? Because technology had changed things. The highway had been improved. Bridges put in place, hills perhaps uh, uh, had separated things uh, because this is the way the world's gone is things happen quickly. Who'd have ever thought a smartphone that you can get pictures, videos, uh, update things, talk to people live, uh, uh, Amazon, uh, six days, you can buy something on the internet and from the United States to your front door, I've done this, uh, and within six days it's landed at your door. That's why it's in our nature to be impatient. And one of the traps or the mistakes that we can make as a believer is we want to take shortcuts. But shortcuts are always seductive. In the text, here is a couple who have been promised by God himself that they're going to have a son. Now granted, you know, she's not in her 30s, 40s, I'm not quite sure the age, I didn't do my homework. But this is God who has said, we're going to give you a son. But they became impatient. 
How many know that's exactly what you and I do? That's what happens to us. We become impatient and so we go looking for an easy solution. And, you know, for all the men here, I know you quietly kind of read this and think, well, I wonder if Hagar was a bit of a sort. I wonder if she's a bit of a, you know, a, bit of a looker here, a bit of a babe or, you know, who knows. You know, men would view this differently. All the women would just see, you know what, she was probably really ugly. She's probably a real nasty cow and, and who, who knows. I'm just using in my imagination here but the fact is they took a shortcut I mean God has promised it's called the Abrahamic Abrahamic covenant and he'd reinforced the promise to Abram on the journey with Lot remember Abraham had left or called Abram then he'd left in faith and taken all of his livestock all of his household all the families uh, with his nephew Lot they were traveling uh, and uh, midstream along the way on that journey with Lot uh, God even came and visited him again and had reminded him Genesis 13:16 I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth then your descendants also could be numbered. That is an incredible statement that God's made to him. He's saying, Abraham, there's going to be so many children that come from you. But like us, he'd become impatient. In Genesis 15, 2 to 3, But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Now, it was after Abram had demonstrated that, that God continued to help him. But still, he took things into his own hands. It seemed logical. Verse 2 says, Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. See, it's always tempting to look for an easier way to get things done. But the quick, easy and cheap almost never works. Because in the long run, it can turn out to be slow, hard and costly instead. This is why Solomon made this statement in Ecclesiastes. He said, the race is not to the swift In other words, what Solomon was saying, he learned something about life is that what's obvious isn't always that obvious. Or how we think that something should be doesn't necessarily mean that's the way that it's going to be. But the lesson for you and I today is most things of quality are built slowly. It's over time. And they come at a significant price. I was reading about the most visited landmark in Germany It's the Cologne, I'm not sure the pronunciation, cathedral. Lucky Sarah's not here, she won't know. But it's a cathedral. It's the largest Gothic church in Northern Europe. They started building it in 1248, paused the building project, 1473. All of you here waiting for your house to be built are impatient. It's been 12 months. It was completed in 1880. It took 640 years to build. So think about it. The people who planned it, started building it, worked on it, they're all dead and gone. It's still not finished. 660 years later, it's finished. But today, it is the most visited landmark in Germany. 20,000 visitors per day visit this cathedral. It took time to build it. See, when an enterprise is built on hard work, those are the enterprises that endure. It's one quality step at a time. It's one day at a time, one step at a time. Isaiah 28 talks about precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. It's almost like God is deliberately repeating himself in his word. Because what he's saying there is it's a repetition of steps. But that's why shortcuts rarely take you to your desired destination and never in the way that God had intended. He uses time to his advantage because he has no time restraint. 
See, God is the Alpha and the Omega. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. See, that is why it takes time to build a church. Pioneering a church, it is such a radical concept. It is such a foreign concept, in fact. How many of you know about new churches being started? It was very interesting. I had a conversation with one of the pastors as they were leaving. They, they actually booked. There was a bit of a muck-up, and that's why we met them yesterday. They were here when we were meant to be here, so we had to wait for them to leave. And I was talking to the pastor. He's a very, very nice man. I was talking to him about it and just about uh, the realities of how now there's no interest uh, uh, with councils in churches. Uh, uh, they, they don't really care. They're not interested. Uh, but I was thinking, uh, how often do you hear about a church starting? I mean, you don't, do you? It's a foreign concept. In fact, when anybody thinks about Christianity, they go looking for a church. Oh, let's find a church. Well, does anybody ever wonder how it got there? Someone started it. And that's like a good marriage, a robust marriage. It takes years and years and years to build it. Sometimes along the road, there's the ups and downs, there's the difficult times, there's the hardships, but it's the couple that pushes beyond that, that eventually builds a strong, robust, substantial home and family. It's the same with raising children, successful children. It's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It's one step after another, after another. It's through the good times, it's through the bad times. Pick any subject. You want to be academic, pick any subject. There's no shortcuts that lead to success. And what is important is he builds you as well, slowly, over time. And we are all a work in progress. So I want to highlight what I want to call some mandatory matters in not taking shortcuts, in not falling to the error of Abram in Sarai in the account that we've read in our text the first or one of the important mandatory matters in our life has to be our Bible. You know, a world without the Word of God at its basic best is absolutely faulty. If you want to have a decent home, a decent marriage, a decent family, in fact, if you want to have a decent life for that matter, you've got to build it on the Bible. Because everything about the world is a faulty foundation. It's sandy, it's dodgy, it's dangerous. And a point in case, if you think of the diabolical, demonic endorsements of the world today, think just for a moment about gender choice. It astounds me on a form. Male, female, or it's got undecided or, you know, trying to make up my mind which one or I don't know what phrase. They get these weird phrases. But when I ever look at that, it's like, you know, how did it ever get to this? Easy. Just chuck out the Word of God. Just throw away the Bible. Homosexuals raising children or homosexuals being married. That, that is an absolute abomination. How did that happen? Throw away the Bible. And see, any subject, if you disregard the word of God, it is an unstable foundation. In our text, the literal mistake that Abram made is he ignored God's word. I've done that. You've done that. We all do that. He just bypassed it. And I'm sure that Sarai, perhaps in, a, in, a, in an emotional moment, a desperate moment, maybe she's just feeling so sorry for her husband you know, because he doesn't have the baby. I haven't fallen pregnant yet. She's perhaps feeling condemned, feeling wrong, feeling like it's her fault. A woman will feel her husband's predicament. And so, you know, she comes up with this. You'd have to look on and go, what a harebrained idea. Who thought up that one? But you know something? He didn't have to agree to it. He knew what God had said to him. He knew what God's word said. 
but he chose to ignore it and he bypassed it. See, God's words are the paving stones that lead to success in any venture. In Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And that is why any subject that you're in need of instruction, the answers are in the word of God. Whether it's to do with your mind, morals, money, marriage, pick a subject, the answers are in the word of God. And yet how many people build their lives disregarding the word of God? making monumental decisions that they know uh, conflict and cut right across the grain of Scripture. They're sandy, unstable decisions, uh, but they make them ignoring the Word of God and thinking that somehow they're going to be exempt. See, shortcuts don't work. And to neglect the consultation of His Word, it's foolhardy. Moses is reiterating to the children of Israel the importance of God's word in Deuteronomy 32. And he said to them, set your heart on all the words for it is not a futile thing for you because it is your life and by this word you shall prolong your days in the land. Another translation, they are not just idle words for you, they are your life. And so you've got to not just read the word of God, you have to heed it and you have to apply apply it and here's a trap for every one of us that have been around Christianity is we know so much of what the Bible says you know the the church is like ours they're built on preaching uh, preaching reiterated teaching over and again repetition of the same truths Uh, but the problem is uh, we can become familiar with it and yet disregard it we know it And how often do people do this when they're taking a shortcut and want to do their own thing? They will quote the word of God conveniently. But at the same time, bypass it and disregard it. See, we need to investigate what he says in that instruction manual. Another thing that we have to do, a mandatory matter, is talk to God. We have to exchange with the master of all wisdom and knowledge. We have to engage him through conversation and appeal. And I'm avoiding the word prayer because the moment they say the word prayer, people switch off. So I'm I'm trying to word it for you a different way. We have to engage him through conversation and appeal. Listen, prayer is just that. It's talking to God. It's conversation. Psalm 77, 14, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. I want to urge us as a church, learn to ask him for instruction and guidance and wisdom. Ask him. It's not about prayer meetings. It's not about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the timing. It's not about being seen. All those things are important. They're different sermons. Uh, But listen, uh, prayer is about conversation. It's about going to God and saying, Lord, I need some advice. I need your instruction. I need you to tell me how to be the family you want me to be. I need to know what direction I take in life, my decisions. Uh, I need to know with my finances, my money, uh, how I should appropriate it, what I should do with it. Uh, I need to know, Lord, in relationships, how to conduct myself. Listen, uh, if you will engage God, if you will begin to speak with him about these things, he'll help you. It's why he says in Proverbs 4, 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. How many people know life is filled with conundrums? These are those mind-bending situations that we don't have the answers for. It's a conundrum. It's something that you that you got to spend your mind occupied with. You're trying to work it out. You're trying to work it out. Uh, but the problem is, do we ever go to God for instruction with those conundrums? Do we speak to him about it? One of the reasons why people don't is impatience. Going back to this fast life we live now is it doesn't happen fast enough. 
I want to just click on it and get the answer. How many people do that here? When you want the answer, my, I've watched my wife do it this week. I want to know how you do something. How does it work? How do you, oh, we'll just Google it. In fact, if you don't type it in, you just ask Siri. She'll tell you anyway. We want to know straight away. And we're conditioned that way. But the problem is we think that it's going to be like that with God. But can I just give you some advice? It isn't. Sometimes you've got to take time if you're going to get understanding. That's why he says it in Proverbs, in all you're getting, get understanding. He's saying wisdom is a principal thing, therefore get wisdom. It's not an instantaneous click on YouTube and he's going to tell me what to do. Another reason why people won't engage God is unbelief. Never admit that, never speak up and say that, but the truth is, so if we really believe that God can help me or speak to me or give me the answer, we'd engage God, wouldn't we? But if you grip with unbelief, you won't bother. See, do you really genuinely lay hold of God in English? When's the last time you talked to him for 30 minutes in English? No, but you know, you play on the phone. Reading your Bible in prayer is not praying. And being at prayer doesn't mean that you pray. It's conversation. You've got to engage him. And you have to refuse to quit until you see change and a positive outcome. That's why James 5 talks about the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Oftentimes, the reason why our prayers are perhaps ineffective is we're not fervent. You ever gone into a shop or there's a group of people you walk into and you want to ask a question, you feel awkward? You're a bit tentative, you know, a bit... You know, you kind of wait or you're waiting to feel a little bit less self-conscious. You know what? Sometimes you can get like that in prayer. It shouldn't be like that. It should be bold. It should be full on. It should be, you know what, Lord, uh, we've got this situation. I've got this mess. Uh, I'm encountering this. I've got the conundrum. God, you can tell me what to do. God, speak to me. And sometimes you've got to lay it out in detail, tell him exactly what it is. We can often think it up here, but do we speak it out? That's what conversation is. I've sat with people before for two hours in the same conversation. That's what we're talking about here that we have to do with God. That same verse in the Living Bible says, the earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. Uh, we see Jacob in the Old Testament. He prayed and wrestled with God all night. In fact, the Bible says until daybreak. That wasn't a quickie click on two-minute clip YouTube conversation. All night, the Bible says. In other words, the conundrum, the, the mind-bending predicament, he talked to God and talked to God and talked to God and talked with God and God talked to him and they wrestled it through. It wasn't a wrestle as in, ah, oh, I got you in a headlock and God's going, tap out, tap out. No, I won't tap out, no tap out. Oh, no, my hip's out. No, I you. No, I won't give in. No, I won't give no. Listen, it wasn't that. It was an intense interaction of communication between God and him. See, if he can hold the whole universe together and he can rise again from the dead, surely he can intervene in our personal business. Psalm 147, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. There's one more mandatory matter that can help us. It's acting in obedience. It's the dot on the I, it's the crossing of the T. Because the ultimate specific will of God is discovered as we do the general will of God. It's not enough to just know things academically or intellectually. We have to implement them. See, if you're married here today, you must learn forgiveness and act on it. You've got to act on that. 
In other words, it's not, it's not just speaking it or just saying sorry. You know, I've, I've noticed in the world that sorry's made a big comeback, but it's so shallow. How many of you are waiting and they come back and, sorry to keep you waiting. You're not sorry at all, sweetheart. You were painting your nails and fluffing around eating twisties <laughs> while you were waiting for another manager who's just answering her text to a boyfriend and she was waiting because who she was talking to to get the answer because you don't know any answers is they were having a cappuccino with someone. And now you come back after 43 minutes while I've been waiting here because it's timed on my phone. And we're really sorry for keeping you waiting. You're not sorry at all. It's so shallow. Well, how many people now, we know we're confronted about something, just say, oh, yeah, sorry. I'm really sorry. Sorry. To the point, I've got to be honest with you, when people say sorry now, I'm, I'm almost, almost cynically just in disbelief. See, forgiveness in marriage means you do something about it. You have to act on it. You've got to change some things. Friendships, serving, you've got to act it out. It's not enough to know I need to be a servant so I can be a leader. You've got to start serving. Any subject, pick a subject. You have to implement it. You've got to begin to do it. If you're going to be a disciple, you've got to start following up, working with people. You've got to get involved. You've got to begin to invite people. You've got to fellowship with them. And the fellowship has to be uh, uh, streamlined. It's got to be specific. There's got to be direction to it. You have to give yourself to it. Uh, or finances, uh, you've got to do something about it. You've got to write a budget. You've got to examine where we're going wrong here. You've got to change your way of living and say, we live above our means, so we need to live within our means or below our means. We're going to change it. We're going to drive a different car. We're going we're gonna to change some things here. It's the obedience. James 2, 14 to 17, what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. See, the mistake we can make is we can know a lot of things biblically, academically, but we don't do them. So the Bible says our faith's dead. You know what dead animals are good for? Nothing. You ever had a dead engine in your car or a dead battery? Yeah. No good, car's no good, engine won't start, you're not going anywhere. The car's no good, finished, it's dead. And James says, that's what our faith is like if we don't action, if we don't obey, if we don't implement what we know that God says. And this is why any discipline to our, any, any area of our faith, it grows proportionately. Faith is like a muscle. The more you work it, the stronger it gets. See, for example, in marriage, when you learn to forgive or when you learn to yield to the word of God, your marriage starts to work. So, yeah, but you're not married to her, but you're not married to him. No, you can thank God I'm not but you're not married to my wife either. And she's not me. Hey, listen, join every married person. Faith without works is dead. You've got to do something. See, in our text, Abram and Sarai, their faith was undergoing a crisis. No baby, no pregnancy. Every time she goes to the chemist and buys one of the little things and goes off to the... Toilets and comes back out again. Oh, she's sad again. Still not pregnant, you know what I mean? And so you said, what happens is their faith takes a huge knock. And so what do they do? They step out of the will of God and take things into their own hands. And Sarai said to Abram in verse 2, See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. You and I cannot read that and not be in shock. 
and ask ourselves, Abram, I mean, could you not have said no to her? Listen, love, it's probably not right. It's called committing adultery. Like, we're married and, you know, she's from the other culture. She's not the Jewish girl. You know, I mean, you know, come on. It's not, you don't be that smart even intellectually to work it out. Did you not maybe know that, you know, Sarai's having a bit of a sad, weak moment here? And yet you and I can be exactly like them. Take a shortcut, just take it into our own hands and we just begin to redesign and re, re, rework and just re, reset the word of God to kind of fit ourselves and just take some shortcuts. Because if we neglect to maintain doing the things that we know the Bible says to do, our faith undergoes a crisis. I was thinking about some individuals that came to mind as writing this sermon, people who once used to serve God and people who once perhaps even used to be part of the church, disciples, men, God had a plan for their life and think about where they are today. And people like say, well, you know, it's, it's your fault for this and it's the church's fault for that and it's the fellowship's fault for something else. No. It was a crisis of faith. Because faith without works is dead. When you stop doing certain things that you know the Bible says to do, your faith may already be in trouble. Believe me, it won't take long. It's going to be in even bigger trouble. Because when you start taking shortcuts, you can start yourself a whole Islamic movement, which is exactly what Abram did with that little cheeky babe on that night. That's where the whole Islamic faith came from. Every time you go through the airport and they check in your bag for security, you need to think about that little hot evening. When the man and the woman, in their own will, decided we're going to ignore what God says. We're going to take a shortcut and we're going to do things our way. So I want to finish with success in an area, it comes over time. Sarah fell pregnant. To Abraham, Isaac, the son of promise, was born. And God is such a good God because he still fulfilled his promise to Abraham. Genesis twenty two seventeen. 17, he said, Blessing, I'll bless you. Multiplying, I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. And as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. I've never studied it through, but it's interesting that God talks about the dust. But in this reference, he talks about the stars and he talks about the sand. A little three-point sermon for you right there. But the lesson is success comes over time. There's no quick fixes. And I want to ask you today, what faith-building acts have you been neglecting? Have you been tempted to give in to the shortcuts? Because enduring faith in God's promises is the way to success and his timing is always the best. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes today. If we could.